Hello and welcome to the series about the citizen in the democracy by the Shalom Hartman Institute. My name is Alexander Kay. I am a professor and the chair of Israel Studies at Brandeis University. Today I'm going to discuss with you the idea of Galut, of Jewish exile. We'll be having a brief historical overview of the idea. And then I want to talk especially about the ways in which this idea of Galut pertains directly to the role of an engaged citizen in a modern democracy. In Jewish thought and history, the idea of galut, of exile, begins as a theological conception. And in fact, it goes right back to the very start of, uh, of history, according to the Hebrew Bible, where the beginning of the book of Bereshit, Genesis, just after the creation of the world, Adam and Eve, the world's first two human beings, are expelled or exiled from the Garden of Eden. Famously, Judaism's first patriarch, Abram, is told by God, lech lecha, go for yourself, leave the place that you were born, the place that you've grown up, the place that you know best, and go to another place, a place that I, that God will show you. It's a startling fact that, according to the Hebrew Bible, the creation of the Israelites as a people takes place in a state of exile. It's the people coming out of their enslavement in, in Egypt, in the desert, that become a nation for the first time. Not in the land of Israel that God promised them, but wandering around in the desert. And in the rest of the Hebrew Bible, although much of it takes place in the land of Israel, there is an undergirding narrative, which is about the way that the sins of the people will have or could have and eventually do have the consequence of exile, which is in a sense the way that the historical narrative of the Hebrew Bible end with the leaving, with the, with the, with the Jews leaving the, their homeland in the land of Israel and going into exile. So the Hebrew Bible begins with the, uh, the or at least the story of the Jewish people in the Hebrew Bible begins with them wandering around in the desert and ends with them once again leaving the land. But this idea, as well as being a theological, a theological conception wrapped up in questions of sin, of reward and punishment, also becomes a political conception. And many Jews have interpreted the idea of galut, of exile, meaning to, to mean a state in which Jews are fundamentally not at home. Jews in exile are a disempowered, disenfranchised minority with no power at the whims of the rulers of whichever country they happen to be uh, present in at a given time. And in fact, um, not only have Jews felt this way, um, but many others have interpreted the idea of galut, of Jewish exile, in a similar sense. And um, according to many streams of Christian theology, although in um, more recent times, some um, streams of Christianity have uh, moved away from this idea, but historically, Christians believed that it was the disempowerment, the lack of political power of the Jews, that proved that God had abandoned them as a people and had transferred the covenant with God to Christianity as a whole. So it's not a surprise, perhaps, that two of perhaps the most consequential trends in modern Jewish history have been an attempt to escape this state of galut, of exile. And those two trends are the trend of Zionism on the one hand and the trend of assimilationism on another. So famously Zionism, or at least some streams of Zionism, has at its core the idea that in Hebrew is shlilat hagalut, which means the negation of the exile. According to this central plank of Zionist ideology, for all of these centuries, Jews have been in exile. They have been minorities. They have been disempowered. They have lacked sovereignty. And Zionism is a way of saying no more. We reject this idea of exile. Jews have the right and the need to be in their own home with control over their own lives. And the Zionist movement held out the promise of achieving that goal. And the state of Israel, according to this reading, is the culmination 
of the success of the negation of exile itself. Assimilationism, which um, in a way is the exact opposite of Zionism, whereas Zionism says um, the Jews are, should be a separate nation in their own sovereign territory, an ideology of assimilationism said, says that Jews should not be separate from other people. They should essentially melt away. They should lose their identity and meld into the background of the places where they happen to live. So in many ways, these two ideologies are directly um, opposites of each other. But in a, a fundamental way, they share a goal. Just as Zionism was a rejection of the idea of galut, of exile, so the ideology of assimilationism is a rejection of the idea of galut. It's a rejection of the idea that Jews should be separate, marginal, a minority. But the solution, or whereas the goal is similar to that of Zionism, the solution is very different. Rather than, as Zionists argued, Jews leaving the societies where they currently live and setting up their own state where they can have sovereign control, assimilationists said, no, Jews should stay where they are and they should escape this state of being a minority and a marginalized and oppressed minority very often by losing their Jewish identity and just becoming one of the crowd. The goal though is actually the same, to escape this sense of, uh, of, of um, provisionality, the sense of uncertainty, the sense of marginalization, the sense of being a minority. In fact, it's quite an interesting fact that um, Theodor Herzl, who is really the founder of political Zionism as a movement, before coming to the idea of Zionism, he writes in his own diary, he considered as an other solution to what he called the Jewish question, that all Jews should just convert to, he was living in Europe, so for him it was Christianity, and if all Jews just became Christians, the um, Jewish problem, this problem of how do Jews fit into wider society would disappear. And in Herzl's own telling, um, it was his understanding that that, that idea was uh, impossible, was, uh, was something that could not actually be achieved, that led him to consider other options, including eventually Zionism. Now, so as I've said, these two very significant tendencies in modern Jewish history of Zionism and assimilationism um, argue for negating the exile, getting rid of the exile, escaping the exile. But actually, um, more recently, many Jews are once again championing the idea of Galut, and they argue that we should not negate the idea of Galut, but we should embrace the idea of Galut. And many Jews who argue this argue that fundamentally, Jews are not a people should that should have political power. Jews should reject the idea of having control over a territory or a state or control, legal or political control over other people. And the real home of Jews, argue um, this group that I'm talking about, the real home of Jews is not a state, it's not a territory, but it's the text or the tradition. Jews, in a sense, are allergic to political power and control, and, and they should avoid taking on political power or control wherever possible. Now, often this position of this new kind of reimagining and, and uh, championing of the idea of Galut is very often, whether this is said explicitly or not, it's very often a response to Zionism and a rejection of Zionism. Often people that have this position observe that Zionism, while it has had um, uh, uh, unquestionably benefits for many, many, many Jews, comes with a lot of um, the best, the, the, uh, with a lot of complications, to say the very least. That having control over other people, having military power, having legal authority comes with all kinds of moral qualms, all kinds of um, ways that people can become morally or politically compromised. And this idea of embracing Galut as saying Jews should not have political power, Jews should not care about the ter territory, Jews should not care about the state. This is in a way an attempt to escape the moral complexities of political power today. In my opinion, this position really misses the central meaning of Galut as it's been historically understood. And in my view, as, as it can most 
and profitably be applied to the state of Jews and for that matter of other people today. And the, the mistake is this, Galut historically was not about a lack of political power or self-government or organization. It's not about a lack of power at all. And in fact, and this is a, a nuanced point, but a very important one, the idea of Galut, of Jewish exile historically was not about a lack of feeling at home or rooted in a place. In fact, it was very much compatible with a sense of being at home. And this tension of um, both feeling outside and inside at the same time is encapsulated again in, in the Hebrew Bible, which uh, where we have uh, sections, for example, Psalm 137, um, by the rivers of, rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and, and, and wondered how could we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So there's something fundamentally problematic about being in Babylon in exile. But at the same time, Jeremiah, the prophet of exile, tells his own people in chapter 29 of the book of Jeremiah, as they are sitting in exile, don't try and get out of this place. Build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat their fruit, have families and grow there and seek the peace of the city in which God has made you exiles. Pray to God in this exilic state because with the peace of the place that you live, you yourselves will find peace. So there is this tension here that my teacher, um, Professor Yerushalmi, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, um, who wrote a great deal about the idea of Galut, argued, and I'm going to quote him here, he said that it is, quote, simultaneously possible to be ideologically in exile and existentially at home. Again, it is possible to be ideologically in exile whilst at the same time being existentially at home. And again, just to quote one further um, short excerpt from his writings, that Jews historically, Yerushalmi argued, had, quote, the simultaneous awareness of being in exile, yet to the profound sense of attachment to the land or the place in which one lives. So there is something to be said for Galut being something theologically or existentially or ideologically um, uh, exilic, whilst at the same time being completely compatible with being having a strong belonging, a strong sense of living in the place where you are. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Look at the history of the Jews. I'll just give you one example of very, very many. Let's think about the Jews in the Iberian Peninsula, what later became Spain and Portugal. Many Jews who know a little about Jewish history think of Jews in Spain and they think of the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. But it's perhaps less known that um, Jews had lived in Spain for something like a millennium, maybe more. The earliest archaeological evidence that was recently found um, of Jews living in Spain is from the end of the fifth century of the Common Era. And it's quite possible that Jews had been there for a long time before that. So Jews living in a place for a thousand years, even though there were um, at periods, moments of oppression, moments of forced conversions, and ultimately an expulsion. Yes, and that should not be ignored. But over a thousand year period, you think that Jews didn't feel that this was their home over the many, many, many generations in which they spoke the languages of the place, in which they um, had children and grew old and died in this place, in a place in which they were embedded in its culture, where they became viziers and generals and poets and scholars, did they not also feel at home, even while continuing to call themselves an exilic people? So I would argue that historically exile has always been compatible with Jews feeling at home. It's possible for Jews to have a sense of belonging, a sense of power, a sense of political engagement, even while being in this state of galut. And I think this is particularly important for Jews in America because it's often said that the contemporary American Jewish community is an exception in Jewish history. And in many ways, it certainly is. In many ways, Jews are better off by many indices in 21st century America than they have been in other times, um, at other times and in other places. But 
This is not the first time that Jews have felt deeply at home in a place, even while preserving this idea of being theologically, existentially in exile. And that is why I believe that the idea of galut, <clears throat> the idea of exile, can have a lot to say, if understood in a sophisticated way, a lot to say about the role of an engaged citizen in a democracy, whether it be in the United States or elsewhere. For Jews to have a feeling of being full citizens and fully belonging and being at home in a place, even as they um, understand themselves in some sense to be in Galut. Let me now tell you the three ways that I think that this idea of Galut may be particularly relevant for Jews in the United States and other contemporary democracies. The first thing I want to say is that the ideology of Galut can help Jews be what Michael Walzer called a connected critic. Michael Walzer, um, a very important um, political theorist, uh, argued that there are two kinds of criticized criticism, two ways that a person can criticize a society. One is to stand completely on the outside, to judge a society by some universal standards that are plucked from the mind or from the air, and, um, and to chastise or to judge society by those standards. And this, this means standing completely apart from society and to offer a, a, a very often judgmental, sometimes overbearing, disconnected form of criticism. It involves being separate from the people to whom the criticism pertains. And typically this kind of criticism is not very successful because generally speaking, people do not respond well to criticism that comes from a total outsider that doesn't share in the stakes of what it means to be in that society. But, it's, but a connected critic in Walzer's term is somebody who is both insider and outsider at the same time. Someone who feels themselves belonging to the society that they want to improve and separating themselves, not to be totally on the outside, but just by an inch or two inches, just enough to be able to say, look, even though I belong in this society, even though I am one of you, I still see ways that things could be better, that not you, but that we could do better. This is criticism with sympathy, criticism often with optimism of the ability to do better, and most of all, criticism by people that share the stakes of society as a whole. And I think that this idea of a connected critic is something that the theology of Galut can actually support. The sense of being simultaneously deeply at home, deeply belonging in a place, while still also being able to have the imagination of what it might be for the place to be better, what it might be to stand slightly outside from society enough to see how it could be improved. That's the first way that I think Galut may have something to say about the role of a citizen in a modern democracy. The second thing I have to say about the way that Galut can, pertains to um, the idea of democracy, uh, of, of being a citizen today, is that Galut allows citizens to, it provides citizens with the imagination of what it means to be an outsider. Often um, citizenship is not just uh, related to, but is in some theories, in some modern political theories, citizenship is defined by being a part of the in-group, which is entirely different from what it means to be an out-group. Here is the state, here are the borders of the state. If you are a citizen, it means you are on this side of the line. And if you are not a citizen, you are on that side of the line. You are an outsider. You are not part of the political conversation that we are having here. This is the kind of mentality that accrues to the terrible cost of the most vulnerable people in the globe today people who are the most marginalized, the most disenfranchised, people who have lost citizenship of the place that they grew up, people who are pariahs in the term of Hannah Arendt, people who are, the, who are refugees, who are asylum seekers, people who have no place to be. And if the entirety of the uh, rhetoric, the entirety of the discourse around citizenship ignores people who are on the outside in that respect, then we are um, doing not just um, people who are on the outside, but ourselves morally, we are doing a deep, deep disservice. The idea of Galut allows us, while being at home, while feeling a sense of belonging, 
to never lose the imagination of what it means to be a radical outsider, of what it means to be homeless, of what it means to be disenfranchised, what it means to be in the desert. And it's my hope that um, this idea can help people who are engaged in the conversations around democracy and citizenship today, whether it be in the United States or elsewhere, to have those conversations whilst feeling a kinship with those who are on the other side of the border, with those who need help, who need protection. The third way that I think that the idea of Galut may pertain to the idea of being a, a, a citizen in a contemporary democracy is that uh, it, it allows us to think of belonging, of having a stake in a society without translating that feeling of belonging into a sense of ownership or a sense of domination. Now, there are all kinds of versions of belonging, political authority, political control today that people immediately associate with the sense of ownership. It's not just that we happen to have power in this place that we can wield in a way that is moral and just and to the benefit of everybody, but it is that we have this power because this place is ours. This place is a place that we own. This place is a place that we, by all rights, have total control over to the exclusion of other people. And there are all kinds of versions of and more extreme versions of ethnic nationalisms that have this kind of ideology. And white supremacy in itself is in some ways the, the, the archetype of this ideology, um, which says that certain people um, of a certain race, and of course the idea of race is invented in order to support this ideology. These are the people to whom society belongs. And if other people come and try and take that society away from them, then, the, then that society has to be defended by the people who own it, who have control, who have domination, and who have power. But I think the idea of Galut allows us to contemplate what it might mean to be at home in a society, to feel a sense of belonging in a society, but not to feel a sense of exclusive ownership, of untrammeled power in that society. A place where you can, an ideology that allows you to feel um, uh, at home in a place, but also to recognize that other people may feel at home in that place, have the same rights to you in that place, even if they may disagree about the future or the values of the society itself. It is a way of engaging in a democratic way with other people in a society without resorting to an ideology of extreme domination and exclusive control and ownership. The very first Rashi, the very first comment of the greatest bi biblical commentator in Jewish history on the Bible, um, that of, of Rashi, um, says that the reason that the Torah tells us that God created the world is that so that when the Jews are in their land, they won't think that they are in their land and have no um, other, and that, that no other people could ever be in that land as well. The fact that God created the world means that it's not the people, but it's the God who decides who is there and who is not there, who is there for now and who may not be there later on. It's a way of feeling and um, belonging to a place without feeling a sense of um, self righteous ownership and control over the place. I think in all of these ways, the theology of Galut, the ideology of Galut, can add to the idea of a citizen in a democracy, not by negating Galut altogether and saying we have to get rid of this idea, um, as, as, as some Zionists have done and as some assimilationists have done, and at the same time, not by embracing this idea, but in a, a way that's lacking in sophistication of considering that Galut is all about Jews being somehow allergic to power, allergic to belonging, necessarily on the road and never really belonging to a place. I think a sophisticated ideology of Galut, which recognizes that it is entirely compatible with a sense of belonging, having a sense of a stake in a society, and at the same time provides us with the imagination of being able to help our society become better in whichever ways that we can, of giving us the imagination to support the most vulnerable people in our globe, on our globe today, and at the same time, allowing us to be engaged citizens without resorting to the ugly kinds of domination and ownership that we see rearing its head in political rhetoric too often 
today.